Hello, everyone. Um, just to quickly introduce myself, my name is Matei Tikindalian. I'm a second year PhD student um, in the Costa Institute of Archaeology. Before I begin Dr. Candelora's introduction, I would like to read a short statement. The Coatsen Institute at UCLA acknowledges the Gabrielino Tongva peoples as the traditional land caretakers of Tova Angar, the Los Angeles Basin and South Channel Islands. As a, land grant, as a land grant institution, we pay our respects to the Honuk Betam ancestors, Ahi Hirom elders, and Eyo Hihinkem, our relatives, relations, past, present, and emerging. Dr. Danielle Candelora is an Egyptian archaeologist and an assistant professor of ancient Mediterranean history at SUNY Corland. She earned her PhD in Near Eastern Languages and Cultures from UCLA. And her dissertation, dissertation is entitled Redefining the Hyksos, Immigration and, I, and Identity Negotiation in the Second Intermediate Period. Her research investigates the multivariate processes of identity negotiation in the Eastern Nile Delta during the Second Intermediate Period, an era of intensive immigration from the Levant, which culminated in the rule of the Hyksos in the north of Egypt. She explores how immigrants integrated it into an influence of Egyptian society, as well as the cultural blending which resulted. Danielle is a co-director of the AEF Osiris Ta Neb Ankh Research Project, a co-director of the Museology Field School at the Museo Gizio di Torino, and a member of the UCLA Coffins Project directed by Kara Cooney. Now, please join me in welcoming Professor Candelora with a round of virtual applause. Um, Thanks very much, Mate. Uh, so first, I want to start out by saying um, thank you so much to Mate and Celine for inviting me, and thank you to Deirdre for making all this work. <laughs> um, and I want to say it's really nice to be back, quote unquote, back uh, at UCLA, um, talking to all you guys at the Coatsin. So it's very nice to be home, as it were, um, and, and take a little break from the Trump land that I have found myself in. Uh, Okay, so um, today I'm going to be talking to you about immigration politics in the ancient world, and I'm sorry about <laughs> the fact that this happened uh, right alongside the election. Um, thank you all for still coming out uh, in spite of the blood pressure issues that we're all dealing with. Um, I'll be talking about both uh, xenophobic political rhetoric as well as accommodation strategies um, by immigrant populations in Egypt in the second intermediate period. Okay, so um, you heard Mate mention the Hyksos and they are mainly who I study. And the question is, who are the Hyksos? Uh, Hyksos, the word Hyksos is just the Greek version of an Egyptian title, uh, Hekahasu right here. Uh, meaning ruler of foreign lands. And here it is rendered in the hieroglyphs. These are uh, a set of six kings, kings that are uh, of foreign descent. They were originally from the region of the Southern Levant or even up into Syria, we're not quite sure. Um, but they ruled over an entire sort of population of immigrants in the Eastern Delta of Egypt in the North from their capital at Avaris. And so we have this sort of wave of immigration coming from what is now Israel, Palestine, Jordan um, into the Eastern Delta right around 1800 BC <clears throat> and culminating in the rule of the Hyksos in the North uh, starting around about 1650 to 1550 BC. At the same time in the South, uh, we have a native Egyptian dynasty ruling from the, the city of Thebes down here. And they're going to start a war to expel the Hyksos from the north. And the interesting thing is, is that we still know actually very relatively very little about the Hyksos themselves. So we're gonna start by looking at a lot of um, texts, political texts. And so I want us to get, to get us a little bit accommodated to uh, the cast of characters that we're gonna be running into. So the main uh, guy we'll be dealing with in the north is a Pepe. My arrows have migrated a little bit. Sorry about that. 
um, a Pepi located here in Avaris. He's the, the sort of despotic Hyksos king in the north. And then this heroic group of Theban kings in the south, um, Second and Reita, Kamos, and Amos. Um, and they're going to really begin and finish the war uh, to expel the Hyksos from Egypt. Okay, so Kamos, the middle of those three Theban kings, um, wrote a uh, several stela in which he made records of this war of re reunification. And in this group of sources, the Hyksos are really much, they're very much cast as the bad guys um, in, the, in, the, in the conflict. And they really come off as a barbaric group from the East who violently invade and they cause chaos and destruction all over Egypt. And so I've pulled a nice excerpt out from one of the Kamos stelae. Um, so you can see details like everyone is being milked by the taxes of the Asiatic. Um, and my, my desire is to rescue the Egypt, which the Asiatics have destroyed, right? So we definitely get a strong sense of the Hyksos as kind of a nice like 18th century European understanding of a of Middle Eastern despot type ruler um, who are really overburdening their subjects with taxes and things like that. We also get a sense, not only that the Hyksos invaded violently and caused a lot of destruction, but that Kamos and Amos, his successor, uh, caused quite a bit of destruction in the process of expelling the Hyksos from Egypt. So here from later down the stela, we have a, uh, a record of the fact that Kamos destroyed their towns and burned their homes to reddened ruin heaps forever. Okay, so archeologists that are, you know, like only out to prove the texts are drooling here and thinking we should be able to find some destruction layers, all that nice stuff. Um, indeed, that's not how it works. We don't have any evidence of the initial invasion of the Hyksos, nor this destruction at their capital uh, during the expulsion. So this is all really boils down to just extremely xenophobic rhetoric that's building on previous anti-immigrant sentiments in Egyptian literature but specifically in literature and not in practice or in policy. Um, this is actually a period where um, immigrants are being welcomed into the Eastern Delta in order to do the jobs that Egyptians don't wanna do, uh, specifically mining expeditions to the Sinai and uh, to be seafaring sailors on the Mediterranean. So the narrative, that narrative of political rhetoric uh, that is uh, written in the Kamos text gets picked up and, and magnified in later sources, specifically sources like Menetho's History of Egypt, which is preserved in an even later text. Um, and again, if you read through the quote, you get a good sense uh, that the Hyksos are invaders of an obscure race. Um, interesting. Um, and that they caused a whole slew of destruction in the, in, the, uh, in the course of their invasion of Egypt. <clears throat> All of this narrative, this political rhetoric gets reified in early scholarship, especially because early scholarship is mostly concerned with working on the classics, uh, Greco-Roman literature, um, and on anything that would have, have to ha would have um, dealt with biblical questions. Uh, so this narrative in Josephus, where he's copying Manetho, um, is a favorite in early scholarship. And so they kind of accept this narrative wholesale in the early scholarship. So the second intermediate period, traditionally, as I will say um, many times today, <laughs> The traditional narrative is one of political fragmentation and economic crisis, everything from recession to famine to plague and icing on the cake, despotic rule by the foreign horde, right? But no one has really talked about the fact that these Theban texts, which are the root of this narrative, are really charged political rhetoric 
that was carefully crafted to control and edit the truth, whatever that may be, of not only the historical narrative, but also the social identities it constructed. These are propagandistic victory monuments, um, which were then imbued further with religious significance um, by being placed in the most sacred Amun temple at Karnak. This is the most sacred site in Thebes. Yet, despite the, the gravitas and the heated political climate in which these texts were composed, the Kamos Karnak stelae are still riddled with details that we're going to look at. Uh, which seems strongly at odds with the expected narrative, uh, that narrative that you would expect to be very pro Thebes. So first I wanna give a few examples of how these texts can be reread and analyzed more critically to get a, a more realistic sense of the period. And then we'll turn to the archeological record. Okay. So my analysis of these texts is grounded in three different theoretical approaches, um, and they do kind of go together, actually. So the first one would be the literary theory of deconstruction, which searches for internal contradictions within the text uh, that work against or resist the overall message. And they can actually tell us a bit about the, um, the, the intentions and maybe even the biases of the author. So these are basically small, unexpected details which seem to undermine the narrative. The second theoretical approach, uh, monumentality theory, is investigates monuments as active objects uh, that are often official, redacted versions of history. Uh, they're purposefully prepared memory meant to be socially shared. And then third, intertext, uh, intertextuality is essentially analyzing the influences and exchanges between texts and how that affects readers' understanding or reception of those texts. Okay, and they will all go together, I promise. <laughs> all right, so let's start with an example of deconstruction. The first stela of Kamos starts with the king's council urging him not to go to war with the Hyksos. Um, in fact, they argue that the situation is just fine the way it is. Yet uh, these lines in particular show some striking details, which if we reread these without the, the expected pro-Theban understanding, they suggest a new understanding of the relationship between the two capitals, between Thebes and Avaris in the Delta. These lines clearly suggest that the Thebans enjoyed beneficial uh, trade and grazing agreements with the Delta. And so we can see that apparently um, Delta grown agricultural products are regularly sent to Thebes and Theban livestock could even be driven north uh, to the prime grazing land available in the Delta. And in fact, there is no discussion or mention of payment for any of these benefits, right? Um, and so this, this supports the notion that they were free perks, uh, possibly a savvy political move by the Hyksos um, meant to ensure one of two things that I can think of. Uh, one, that the Thebans are satisfied with the status quo and less likely to attack. And two, um, that maybe it would encourage a reciprocal diplomatic gift of Southern gold, which is kind of the one major item that the Hyksos don't have direct access to. So in fact, uh, Kamos's council tries to placate the king by saying, we still have Egypt. He has the land of the Asiatics. And in, in this line, really amazingly dismissing the entire northern half of the country as a foreign land that they just shouldn't be concerned about. So these lines are some of the first hints um, that Kamos alone was the aggressor in the war. And um, this is a detail which one can detect again and again in these texts if they're not read with that standard uh, understanding of the Hyksos as the bad guys. Okay, don't panic. <laughs> um, another great detail to pursue when you're looking at uh, deconstructive analysis is titles, the use of titles in these texts. 
And the second stila actually opens with a famous scene of Kamos in mid rant about the political situation. He's shouting that the Hyksos Apepi is being miserly in calling himself a Heka, right here, um, while calling Kamos aware. Uh, so Heka meaning ruler or something to this effect, and where meaning something like chief. So regardless of the translation difficulties, and I promise you there are many <laughs> for this line, I've given you four of many examples. Um, this, the implication of the phrase is still clear, right? So the author of this text understood that the Hyksos Apepi considered himself to be Kamos's superior in political station. The final two translations on the slide there, they even suggest that Apepi was the more powerful ruler, so much so that he had some role in uh, raising Kamos to his current position. Okay, so my question here is why the author would record this information on his king's victory monument in their most sacred temple. This line could have easily read something along the line. Um, a peppy will pay for his vile boasts. And there you get to uh, avoid that nasty detail that makes Kamos seem less powerful than, or even a vassal of the Hyksos king. So, I have to argue that perhaps it was so well known a fact uh, that the author really didn't feel like it needed to be evaded, um, even in a text with such clear political and religious um, intentions. In a much more expected move further down the stela, we see that um, all of the writings of a Pepe's name lack a cartouche. Um, so this, this shape that indicates a, a king's name in Egyptian hieroglyphs. So you can see he is lacking one here. Um, and they're classified by a bound enemy sign as opposed to a sign for a king. So this, is, uh, this kind of negative treatment is much more in keeping with the historical and the religious context of the stela, still allowing the source to name the enemy but invalidating any sense of his legitimacy, right? However, even in these instances, Apepi still receives this title before his name. This is Sa-Ra, or the son of Re, um, which is a detail that provides Apepi not only with legitimacy as a ruler, um, but implicit divinity and divine backing. So he is literally the son of a god here. Again, a really, really strange choice if you're trying to make him look like the bad guy. Okay, so that was deconstruction, a couple of examples. Now we'll do uh, an example or two of intertext, intertextual exchange and monumentality. They kind of go hand in hand. And I believe that it's intertext that is actually the, the place where we can find the source for all of these negative details and the vilification of the Hyksos, um, this idea of a violent invasion and everything. I believe this is coming from intertext. So an investigation of intertext suggests that the Kamos stela were shaped by both earlier Egyptian scribal literature as well as local Theban monuments. Okay, so monuments on the landscape nearby Thebes, in the vicinity of Thebes. So from Middle Kingdom wisdom literature or lamentation literature, depending on how you want to name it, uh, like the prophecies of Neferti, we get the idea of a violent incursion of Southwest Asian groups um, and their unwelcome settlement within Egypt, right? Um, so this might be the actual source of the, the Hyksos invasion is actually just intertextual influence from earlier works. From Theban tombs and temples nearby come uh, not just the use of similarly aggressive or bombastic literature, uh, language, excuse me, uh, that we see in the Kamos texts, which are actually very unusual for Egyptian royal inscriptions, but also the theme of a Theban king being victorious in reunifying the country, the two halves of the country. So specifically, uh, this is the temple of Nepepet Re Montuhotep II, 
um, a Theban king who reunifies Egypt after the first intermediate period, and even, according to these reliefs, had some battles against uh, Southwest Asian groups. So when we consider the uh, identity of the authors of these Kamos texts, creative borrowing from these two bodies of things, right? Uh, Middle Kingdom literature and Theban monuments, they make perfect sense as inspiration. The scribe composing the Kamos texts would be able to show off their training and their erudition through such intertextual references to earlier scribal literature. Um, and in fact, it might have been an attempt to demonstrate their, their knowledge, despite their arguably provincial context, right? They're nowhere near the capital of Egypt down in Thebes. Um, the monuments themselves are, were literally available on the landscape, uh, ready to provide inspiration. So while these sources are poorly preserved for us, unfortunately, um, the Theban elites could have been very familiar with them and could have drawn on them to construct the narrative of Kamos's Theban victory very easily. <clears throat> so again, I believe it's intertext that explains why the textual narrative diverges rather extremely sometimes from the archaeological record. Okay. The Kamos texts are then going to have intertextual influence on later sources, um, especially obvious when you consider the lifespan of the Kamos texts, how long they were literally on display. <clears throat> the first stela, it only stands for a few generations in Karnak, but it's reused as construction fill um, under the reign of Hatshepsut precisely aligning with her somewhat random choice to usurp the Hyksos expulsion as her own accomplishment in this small provincial temple at Speos Artemidos. Kind of a weird choice, but they coincide. The second stela was accessible in Karnak until the early 19th dynasty, which is the same time that we see the composition of a Ramesid story about the quarrel of a Pepi and second Enre as well as um, restorations made to the temple of Speos Artemidos. Okay. Um, so these things are, are corresponding in time for a reason, I believe. <clears throat> the long accessibility of these texts, uh, either as scribal copies or upon the monumental landscape visibly, um, allowed for their influence on these later narratives, especially on Manetho. And we see this reflected in an incredible kind of longevity of detail um, in the texts, um, an emphasis on things like the specific geographic extent of Hyksos rule, uh, the specific extent of their taxation, uh, their refusal to worship the Egyptian pantheon, um, all this kind of stuff, uh, as well as their supposed destructive invasion. <clears throat> Okay, so that was a brief smattering of the, um, the textual work that I've been doing with the Hyksos uh, sources. Um, if anyone has any questions about other examples or anything like that, I'm happy to provide. I'm just trying to smush an entire dissertation into 45 minutes. So that holds true for the archeology span half as well. Um, so let's move on to the archeology span then. Uh, and here I'm gonna be focusing on Hyksos accommodation strategies. So how they and their immigrant subjects negotiated identities or advertised particular aspects of identity in their new homes and in the process forever alter what it means to be Egypt, okay? And um, there's lots of different approaches that I took to this. Uh, but I think today we'll be focusing on immigration theory and communities of practice. Okay, so in ancient Egypt, um, we get this, you know, repeated to us in, in theory and in textbooks all the time. If you were an immigrant in ancient Egypt, if you adapted to Egyptian society and you functioned within your expected social roles, um, you were considered Egyptian. That was that. You just had to like walk like an Egyptian, basically. Um, yet 
so again, much like other areas of the world, like Romanization, we call this process Egyptianization, and there are a lot of issues with it, right? Uh, inherent in this idea is the sense that um, there's only a one-way influence, that anyone would have wanted to become Egyptian and not the other way around, um, that there's some kind of inherent superiority of Egyptian, uh, being Egyptian, that everyone would be striving to, to get to. Few studies have been done which actually account for the intentional maintenance by immigrants of their identities of origin or which allow for any influence of outside cultures on Egypt. Um, so that is where I'll be going today. Okay. So here we are in the Eastern Delta in the uh, Hyksos homeland. Um, and it is a very unique cultural and geographic context in Egypt. Um, it's in constant contact with the Levant and the rest of the broader Mediterranean. Um, and it, it's a very different geographical location. Um, everything from communication to agriculture happens very differently in the Delta than it does in the, in the Valley. <clears throat> Sorry. So despite this very unique situation context, uh, the immigrants, the Southwest Asian immigrants of the late Middle Kingdom and the Second Intermediate Period, including the Hyksos, are often still discussed in terms of Egyptianization. How fast and how much did they try to become Egyptian? The, the Hyksos specifically are traditionally represented as having become or having striven to become as Egyptian as possible extremely quickly. Um, people will say that by the end of their reign, they had completely acculturated to Egypt. You like wouldn't know the difference. That's a lie. Okay. <laughs> um, these traditional interpretations don't account for the possibility like that in mixed communities like the Eastern Delta, where local Egyptians are living alongside immigrants, that both communities would have wanted to adapt to one another. It's a, it's a bi-directional influence. Um, and in fact, we see quite a bit of hybridity and cultural blending in the archaeological record at Tel Adaba or Avaris, their capital city right here, uh, that suggests that indeed they were having a, a bi-directional um, a culturative conversation, if you will. <laughs> in fact, we a great example is the development of hybrid ceramics, um, which are local only to the Eastern Delta, which combine both physical and decorative aspects of Egyptian pottery and Levantine pottery. Um, and this has implications for not just the ceramics themselves, but also food ways, what they're eating, how they're cooking it, how, how they're serving it, etc. <clears throat> and this hybridized ceramics, uh, ceramic tradition actually shows up, excuse me, shows up in the archaeological record fully formed um, at the site of Tel Omaskuta, uh, just, just to, the, to the east of, um, of Tel Odaba on a major trade route uh, to the Levant. And so the idea here is that we're seeing sort of second or third generation immigrants moving from Tel Aldaba or Avaris to Tel Omaskuta uh, to set up sort of a, a trading post, if you will. Um, so again, we're, we're seeing mixed communities and intentional long-term maintenance of that mixedness, um, that hybridity. So people are not trying to become as Egyptian as possible as soon as they can. Okay, so we'll look at the site of Avaris itself or Tel Aldaba. Sorry, I keep switching back and forth between the two. It's the same place, I promise. Um, we like to call this the Venice of Egypt. No one calls it that except me, but <laughs> the Venice of Egypt, it was full of canals and waterways and things like that. Um, it has been an incredible challenge to excavate by the Austrian Academy of Sciences since 1966. They've been going, uh, which is which is amazing. And this is the site, the Hyksos capital, where we start to see lots of foreign influence coming in from Southwest Asia, from the Levant and the Near East, alongside these immigrants starting around 1800 and continuing through the rule of the Hyksos. 
And the interesting thing, again, is that the quantity and the persistence of these foreign cultural markers strongly shows that these immigrants didn't just sort of snap their fingers and become Egyptian overnight, or even arguably ever. All right, so we'll look at a couple of examples. Uh, this is um, from this, I've enlarged this area here, right on the river. And this is an area of the site that in the Hyksos period was a huge citadel fortified, uh, fortified installation. And uh, the, the fortification wall that you see here was eight and a half meters thick, extremely thick. Um, and the important takeaway here is that this was built much more in the style of fortifications that we're seeing in the Levant in the Middle Bronze Age um, and not in a traditional Egyptian way. We see uh, plenty of foreign burial traditions showing up in Avaris in this period. Um, specifically things like uh, the sacrifice and burial of donkeys in the course of the funeral in front of the tomb, and the constant inclusion of these um, particular types of weapon forms that are also being imported by these immigrants. <clears throat> so having a donkey burial in Egypt, I just want to emphasize this, would have been a super strange thing for people to see. This is very foreign to Egyptian funerary practice. Um, and if we keep in mind that funerals were public events and that you literally had to slaughter the donkeys on site in order to do this, uh, this would have been a very public um, marker, advertisement of your foreign origins um, after death, but still. Again, those tombs, those burials are full of uh, weapon forms that originate in Southwest Asia or the Near East. And again, often served as um, strong external markers, indicators of a person's origins in that region, whether it was they who immigrated or uh, someone in their past. Um, <clears throat> and we know that uh, objects like the duckbill ax, for example, um, were used in Egyptian art as markers that someone was from the Levant in this period. We will also see this again. This is the period where we see the introduction of the weapon called the chepesh, uh, which is a scimitar-like sword. Okay, we also see evidence for uh, Levantine religion, Southwest Asian religions joining uh, at Avaris, they found a cylinder seal in one of the palaces that bears a representation of, uh, of a storm god, some version of Baal uh, standing here on his two hills and protector, protecting sailors in their sea journey. Um, and there's lots of symbolism on this seal that we can talk more about that I promise you, um, it is meant to protect seafaring sailors who happen to be Levantine, um, courtesy of this mushroom haircut which again, we can come back to you if you would like. Okay. We also see uh, hints of extremely strange foreign practices um, coming in, not just burial practices, but also either military or legal practices. There's a debate. I'm on the, I'm on the legal side of things, <laughs> uh, but basically in the palace outside the throne room, they discovered a pit, several pits actually, um, filled with severed right hands of individuals. Uh, and some people think this is the beginning of a tradition of taking trophies in war uh, that, that becomes very common in Egypt. I believe it's actually the importation of criminal justice uh, from, the, from the Near East um, that kind of gets misappropriated by the Egyptian military um, and I would love to talk more to you about this. So if someone has a question about it, please do, please do ask. Okay, so beyond that, we also see religious blending. Um, so we're gonna look at a couple of, of examples of, of good cultural hybridity here happening um, at the site of Avaris as well. We see religious blending in this lovely uh, monumental temple precinct 
with two huge temples built in Near Eastern style alongside two Egyptian, standard Egyptian tripartite chapels. Um, and this, the, this is a cemetery in the religious precinct and the graves in this cemetery fall all over the spectrum of a perfectly traditional Egyptian burial to a perfectly traditional Levantine burial and everything in between, okay? So lots of nice um, hybridity going on in the, in the um, cemetery. <clears throat> we also see the permanence of this blending, especially the religious blending at the site. Um, we have a huge temple to the Egyptian god Seth who gets syncretized with that storm god Baal. Um, and this cult is maintained for over 400 years um, and sort of reestablished under the Ramesses. Uh, and again, he, this is Seth, but he is maintaining his um, Southwest Asian qualities in this case. Okay. We already talked about the ceramic implications, um, but we can return to this nice uh, donkey burial example because while at first brush, this might seem to be the most immigrant of all burials um, at the site. In fact, all of the ceramics are local Egyptian ceramics. And this guy was buried with uh, an Egyptian scarab. Um, so an Egyptian seal impression or seal um, with an Egyptian administrative title. His name is in the Egyptian language, but it is Aamu, which is the Egyptian word for someone coming from Southwest Asia. Okay. Um, so yeah, I'll stop harping on it, but there's hybridity everywhere. Okay. When it comes to the Hyksos themselves, uh, the rulers, they also adopt and adapt uh, several elements of Egyptian culture. They absolutely do adapt uh, Egyptian things. They make monumental hieroglyphic inscriptions. That's very Egyptian thing to do. They accept uh, the Egyptian titulary. Uh, so there's traditionally five titles of kingship in ancient Egypt, and they take those five titles alongside Egyptian throne names. In this case, in this door jam, uh, we see a lovely example where he took the traditional titles with Egyptian names, and then here takes the Hekahasu title uh, alongside his Semitic personal name, Sekerher, and that is the name that he uh, includes inside of a cartouche, that symbol of Egyptian kingship. Uh, so that's a really lovely um, moment of blending there. Again, people would like to talk about this source in the sense that, look, they're becoming so Egyptian. They're doing everything in the, you know, the Egyptian titulary and things like that. But he specifically keeps his Semitic name in this case and takes a new title to indicate that he isn't just an Egyptian king. There's also a palette out there that shows um, that people like to use as arguments for the, um, the Egyptianization of the Hyksos king Apepi, where he is uh, really shown himself as the archetypal Egyptian king. He's educated by, by Thoth, the god of scribes. He's the embodiment of Re, uh, the sun god, all that kind of stuff. So there are lots of examples in which they are adapting Egyptian tradition. However, there are also lots of examples where they are blending Egyptian traditions with their own or just outright ignoring Egyptian traditions. Um, so their administration is one such case. Um, they really seem to have made their administrative system work in a way that would have been comfortable to both Egyptians and immigrants. And what I mean by that is that they include both local Egyptians and immigrants in their administration. They continue to use Egyptian administrative practices like scarab seals, um, the use of the Egyptian language, uh, Egyptian titles for different offices and things like this. But they simplify the bureaucratic system, the Egyptian bureaucratic system, down to two positions, uh, the treasurer and the king's son. And they have much broader authority. And this is a much more common way to handle governance in, in uh, the Near Eastern world at the time. 
Many of them also have Semitic names, as you can see, Har, Yakbim, Ilimilku. Uh, and so these are suggestive that the Hyksos actually just overlaid an Egyptian uh, administrative looking facade on a Near Eastern style of government that's based on kinship affiliation, uh, just like other Middle Bronze Age polities um, like at Mari, for example. <clears throat> The Hyksos are also constantly in contact with uh, other Middle Bronze polities in the Near East, um, either sending diplomatic gifts uh, of Egyptian sculpture, lovely, um, or uh, sending letters, much in the way that we would get letters sent in the late Bronze Age um, or the New Kingdom. This one is in fact between the Hyksos king and the ruler of Babylon, right? So everyone is in constant contact. Um, and the idea here is that the Hyksos are really working to keep themselves associated with powerful political allies in the Near East, but also to those lucrative trade markets that are happening in the Near East at this time, which will also, of course, help further bolster their rule in Egypt. <clears throat> The one thing that bothers me again, much the same as the, uh, the textual, the texts being actual monuments, is that the archeology span of Avaris <clears throat> is mostly only survives at the foundation level of buildings. And so people tend to forget that these monumental structures would have been monumental structures uh, and would have been very apparent on the landscape again. And so it's important to remember that almost all of the monumental structures of the city of Avaris during the Hyksos period would have been very clearly built in a Near Eastern style, okay? Everything from temples, monumental temples, to palaces, to the fortification wall, everything like that. And so just an instant um, visual cue, uh, the city would have been instantly recognizable as a Near Eastern city, or at the very least a hybrid city, uh, much in the same way that um, the major architecture of Ptolemaic Alexandria would have been very Greek influenced, or even um, Ramses III's Migdal Temple gate, Migdal Gate at Medinet Habu would have been very apparently Syrian as well. In fact, uh, there's lots of parallels to be drawn with Ptolemaic Alexandria and Hyksos Avaris. Um, they're both perched sort of uh, on the edges of Egypt closest to their homelands. Um, and they're both there very specifically signaling um, identity and origins, right? In an, in an effort to maintain ties with the places that they're from. Okay, last case study. <laughs> Um, in, this, in this case, I was getting pretty frustrated in the course of my research um, with everyone constantly talking about hybridity and no one really working out how it happens on the ground, you know? Um, nobody ever actually thinking about what has to happen, who has to be living with whom in order for hybridity to become a thing in the archeological record. So I turned to communities of practice, which is actually originally a sociological educational theory. Um, but the idea is that people who are engaged in a joint enterprise, uh, who interact daily, they learn from each other and they influence one another's practice and identity. Okay, so we're gonna apply that. Um, I started reading around studies about communities of practice and I landed on the concept of a military community of practice. And the reason this is interesting to me is because the notion of being mutually en engaged in a joint enterprise, sort of the, the key component of communities of practice is heightened to its most extreme degree in a military context, right? Uh, participants are relying on one another for their lives in the military. So these communities are really um, uh, extreme, if you will. These military communities, uh, they forge strongly shared identities through living and training together. They often wear standard uniforms and haircuts. Um, 
studies of immigrants in modern militaries, such as those of Great Britain and the US and Israel, they all found these military contexts to be unique um, instances of cultural blending in which the communal identity of members uh, really heightened cross-cultural awareness uh, between the like natives and immigrants. And uh, it also encouraged the adoption of foreign words, foods, religions, and even values into the host culture. And the interesting thing is, in my opinion, is that we can see this happening exactly uh, with Levantine or Southwest Asian immigrants in Egypt um, in the second intermediate period. <clears throat> so here a slightly later tomb relief, but they are wearing their standard uniforms in their training and receiving their standard haircuts. Um, when we look for the material correlates of this immigration, uh, these communities of practice as archaeologists, we're looking for, um, you know, artifacts and things like that, as well as uh, practice, artifacts and practice. And so when we consider the evidence from Tel Aldaba or Avaris, um, we have already seen numerous artifact forms that are foreign and related to military endeavors, right? So all of these weapons that were imported from Southwest Asia. As we saw, many of the men at the site are buried with these uh, styles of weapons. And the interesting thing is, is they have to be produced in a different way. Uh, new technology has to enter Egypt. They're actually cast using bivalve molds, uh, which is a new process for Egyptians. Um, so at least initially, both these weapons and the technology used to make them uh, were utilized by immigrants uh, at Avaris. Clearly these immigrants teach Egyptians though, uh, since bivalve casting continues in Egypt beyond its initial introduction at, at Tel Adaba. Um, we have some New Kingdom examples down here. Here they're actually casting a, a door for Karnak Temple in a bivalve mold. Certain weapon forms, um, part of these, uh, the shared repertoire of these mixed military communities in the second intermediate period, they catch on as well, uh, chief among which being the Hepesh, that scimitar sword that we saw. In this case, being distributed to the Egyptian army um, almost five, 500 years after the Hyksos period in Egypt. Okay. Immigrant specialists also bring the horse and the chariot to Egypt. And this is kind of a cool a little case study here. So the interesting thing is, is that the Egyptians had all of the technical skills to produce the chariot before the immigrants arrived. What they don't have uh, is the specialized knowledge of how to puzzle piece the chariot together, how to assemble a functioning chariot. And they don't have horses, so that's helpful. <laughs> um, to that, we also have to add skilled personnel to sort of care for and train the horses and also uh, technical prowess. So we need to understand, you know, just having a chariot doesn't help. You also need to be accomplished at firing a bow from a moving platform and you need to understand the tactics uh, in which you would use a chariot, right? So all of those things, at least initially, again, required the expertise of immigrant specialists to produce and to use. Um, many of them do opportunistically move to Egypt, but many are also brought by force. And we have numerous texts, especially from the later, uh, the period after the Hyksos, um, talking about the active capture of craftsmen attached to uh, enemy militaries on campaign and their placement within workshop contexts in, in temple complexes like in Karnak. <clears throat> so you can see here uh, the production of composite bows and chariot wheels uh, happening at the uh, a workshop in Karnak temple, uh, mostly featuring West Asian, captured Southwest Asian specialists. In fact, somebody has propose that this particular haircut is indicative of, of an immigrant. They also really strove to capture foreign mercenaries as well. These people who are um, 
you know, uh, per like purposefully trained in being chariot warriors. Uh, this would be the Mariani, uh, an elite group, again, of specialized chariot warriors. And their capture is documented throughout the New Kingdom uh, in military texts, um, starting right at the beginning of, <clears throat> or sort of right after the expulsion of the Hyksos. In fact, one source actually reports the capturing of 550 of these Marianu, and they specifically emphasize that they were taken alive, right? Uh, because the point is to then incorporate them in the Egyptian military. Um, and this, this sort of practice of taking these prisoners of war and incorporating them in the Egyptian military means that these mixed military communities of practice continue to be mixed for several centuries. It's often overlooked as well um, that maintenance and advertisement of a foreign identity could be seen as beneficial to immigrants and their descendants. So if these in-demand skills and knowledge like a charioteer being a charioteer are known to have Southwest Asian origins, then obviously you would want to emphasize that about yourself. And in fact, we see this in this stila, this gentleman is, is carefully shown as a Southwest Asian um, and a charioteer. In this case, we have the burial of um, the general's charioteer, Yotef Amun. And while nothing is particularly telling about his coffin set, he is buried with his charioteer's whip and a full beard, which is very unusual in, in Egypt and is uh, much more telling, as you can see, of a Southwest Asian uh, descent. Another example would be uh, Dedia. He is a chief shipbuilder who records his lineage back through seven generations in an effort to include one of his ancestors whose name is Pet Baal. Again, Southwest Asian. <clears throat> okay. So how do we actually see these communities having an effect on the ground? Um, we look for their influence, right? Uh, so we can see that in everything from language to military practice and even values. Um, so we'll take loan words first. Uh, loan words are a great example because the, the terms that appear most often in late Egyptian uh, from Semitic languages are those relating to the chariot, horses, and the military. And I believe this really strongly suggests that these terms were learned in mixed military communities uh, directly from Southwest Asian immigrants. <clears throat> Within these communities of practice, uh, local and foreign military practices are also mixed together. Um, so for example, the taking of hands as trophies and the receiving of what we call gold of valor in return. Um, and these really appear kind of like a fully formed practice in Egypt, kind of out of nowhere after the expulsion of the Hyksos. And our first sources that talk about this um, happen like during the war of expulsion. And so uh, I believe that uh, these practices actually get reified in the Egyptian military via the, the, the combination of um, foreign soldiers and local soldiers uh, working together. These practices then become integral to Egyptian society. We even see a later foreign mercenary, this guy is Greek in some sense of the word, um, working for the Egyptians, cutting the hand off of an enemy again, like 400 years later um, in battle. So we see these military traditions having an immense impact on everything from military practice to the social value ascribed to being a, a heroic warrior in Egypt and even what it means to be king. Okay, I'm gonna leave it at that because I think I'm um, over time. <laughs>